Hi, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And I'm joining you from, as usual, a lovely San Diego. And today I'm joined by Jeff Bloomfield, who is up in Cincinnati, Ohio. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm good. It's not nearly as uh, warm as you are, John, today. I can promise you that. I know, and and uh, just just sad to report that we are having a bit of a heat a bit of a heat wave right now, but there is thunderstorms coming later. So anyway, as I always say to people, you get no sympathy for for any weather fluctuations in San Diego from anybody in the rest of the world. So that's okay. Well, we choose to live here, so it's our own doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, uh, Jeff is the CEO of the company Brain Trust, uh, and he is among other things, really, a, I guess in a professional storyteller in many ways is what your, uh, what your, your, your professional um, role is, as you help companies through neuroscience really understand how to get their message out there and how to resonate. And so tell me, Jeff, um, how did you come to the connection between storytelling and then getting into the science of the neuroscience and, and the science behind how our brains react to messages? Yeah, it's 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 funny, John, because we all have a our, our our lives journey, our paths always take us in different directions. And I grew up on a farm. I'm an old farm boy um, in the Midwest in Ohio. And, and my papa, if you're not from the South, that means grandfather. So my grandfather, my papa, he was my mentor, and he was this amazing communicator, this amazing influencer. He used storytelling a lot. He taught me how to drive when I was five, standing between his knees on our old green John Deere tractor, and he taught me uh, problem solvers rule the world. And he was just this constant, like, he wasn't a big, boisterous person, but he communicated in such a way using stories and analogies and metaphors and narrative. I just grew up around it. And whether it was uh, maybe stretching a fishing tail uh, all the way to explaining why um, a particular engine worked the way it did to where a young boy can understand it, he just had this way of communicating. Now, you don't realize it sometimes growing up what you're learning. <clears throat> now, when I was younger and probably in my teenage years, Unfortunately for me, on February 2nd, 1982, I got off the school bus to go down Papal's 50-yard long driveway. Normally, it was just his green Chevy Silverado, but this day it was full of cars. Mm -hmm. Now, what I didn't know was my Papal had stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And on that day in February, an ambulance followed me down that driveway, and it would forever change my life. Um, that would be the last day I ever got to see him. And unfortunately, he uh, slipped into a coma. He passed away. And I was devastated, but it became a catalyst for me because he wanted me to be the first person in our family to get a college education. And so it drove me to be good in school, to get good grades, to go to college. And lo and behold, I ended up in the field of biotech where I got to launch a drug for lung cancer. How about that for some right. divine wow. Wow. intervention? Yeah. And here's where it's relevant um, to us in the sales world. So they, maybe, maybe this sounds familiar. They trained me and quarantined me in the uh, home office for three weeks and they indoctrinated me with the randomized placebo controlled phase three study data, cell biology, cell proliferation, as much data as they could cram into this otherwise small noggin from Ohio. And then they gave me my first territory and they told me to go out and tell the oncologist all this information. So I went into my first territory and not knowing any better, I rolled up all that study data and I went in and I told stories mm -hmm. and I connected with the staff and the nurses and the doctors. And now I always had the data. I always could fall back on, here's the reason why this story is relevant to you. And I'd always end with, uh, I don't know about your lung cancer patients, but as a grand, my grandfather, I'd have given any, anything for one more day, let alone the eight months the drug is given. And I, my numbers went through the roof. And now here's the iron. Sales managers, training, marketing, all rode with me. And they all said the same thing. We don't get it. He doesn't do anything we teach him to do. All he does is tell stories. <laughs> now, I didn't know at the time because I was raised that way. And so I got promoted about three or four times well above my own level of competence. And they asked me to, to, to build a team to launch a new drug for brain cancer. And it was here that I became obsessed with the brain. Initially, just the biology relative to the buying brain or to the uh, blood brain barrier. But then I became obsessed with the, not just the neurobiology, but the neuropsychology and the neurophysiology. And what I found was my papa was a genius. Here he just had an eighth grade education, but here I was several decades later, and I was able to start to look at data research that we were starting to have from an advanced standpoint on neuroscience that proved why he was such an effective communicator. 
Right. And 10 years ago, we started Brain Trust to go out and cobble together all the latest neuroscience research and put it into a program so people could use it to communicate more effectively. Because it makes sense if you think about it, because most um, most uh, people, uh, the background, I mean, most people come from an oral tradition, right? Most cultures have an oral tradition and uh, and important messages are handed down through story. Like my myself, you know, I'm I'm born and grew up in Ireland, right? And we have a tremendous oral history, right? I mean, right. handed down and storytelling, um, you know, storytellers and poets and people were highly celebrated people in the community and if you look across cultures in the world this is the same so it's almost like um you know it's in it's already as you say neuroscience but it's already inbuilt into our dna that stories carry a, a, an immense amount of weight yeah 100 percent. i love what you said that storytellers are frequently celebrated in most cultures and the the reason that they are is because when they communicate that way it's relatable, it's visual, it's emotionally connecting, and it speaks to our brain at a root biology level that's how we were designed uh, to understand the information and to connect with it and to relate to it. And it isn't about storytelling and sales that's once upon a time and this happened sure. and then this happened and then that happened and then the end. It's using the mechanisms that are built into us biologically that storytelling happens to be one of the best vehicles to deliver information that allows it to tap into that part of your brain. Well, because let's face it, Mike, when somebody comes to sell to you, what is the thing that you're most interested in a lot of the times? I know for me is I'm really interested in what they have done with other people, right? Yeah. What 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 are the things because nowadays it's like, okay, there's a lot of information I can find out by myself, but what I can't find out is maybe the experiences you've had with like customers in a like industry, creative problem solving. You've done all these things that's, that is specific to you. And that's really what I crave. Yeah, a hundred percent. And one of the other things that we found is in our, in our neuro selling program, our program's called neuro selling is when you take all the research together that you can't help this, but human beings are, are hardwired for self-preservation. And mm -hmm. so in any sales engagement, you're cut, you have to understand your buyer is, is wired with a self-preservation orientation. And, and not until they trust you personally will they be open to how you can help them professionally. And when you show up and you throw up and you start telling them how great your product is, that triggers their self-preservation mechanism. It puts them on the defensive and it causes them to put all the barriers up to change that you don't realize you're doing because you think that, well, I, I'm communicating to you something that you need. In my mind, mm -hmm. in my world, but guess what? You're communicating as a salesperson from your own self-preservation orientation. And this is really, really important that the order in which you communicate information absolutely matters. So what is that order? So most of us, and we know this from science as well, that when the human brain is under pressure, under stress, it will always communicate subconsciously from its highest level of training. So in sales, if you think about it, uh, almost everyone out there who's listening, what's your highest level of training? Your product, your solution, your service. You get trained, just like when I was a, a rep in oncology, what they trained me, all the data, like they ingrained all that in. And is that important? It's critically important. You absolutely need to know that. But unfortunately for most organizations, it's 99% of what they train. And so when you're under a pressurized sales conversation, which they all are, by the way, no matter how good you are, how long you've been doing it, what comes out of your mouth are self-serving product information. And so sure. that hits the part of the brain called the cortex, the neocortex, that has to be utilized to process data, but it actually isn't the part of the brain that makes the decision. It's the part of the brain that puts up the barriers, the, the skeptical, that's judgmental. And so what we say is most salespeople communicate outside in. Neocortex then into the limbic and root brain where a great communicator and an influence communicates inside out, tapping into that self-preservation emotion of your customer first, and then coming back later and using your product to solve the problem with, not the other way around. Critically important. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I agree. Uh, but let's face it, I mean, most, uh, and you probably know this, but because it probably brings you a lot of business, most companies train product first, right? And yeah. salespeople, you know, maybe they'll, a lot of people will be going to sales kickoffs come January in various parts of the country, and they will be put through intensive product training, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and it's, here's the way we like to talk about it, John. It's there's, again, the personal trust, professional trust, it's connection and credibility. And I need to, I need to have both. 
I need to be perceived by my customers having yep. both. But we train our, our, our salespeople so that they're so credible. But we think that we're training them to be credible by giving them all the information we possibly can about our product in hopes that our customers can actually see the value in the product. And guess what? They don't care. I don't, I don't want to, I want to be a bucket of cold water sure. on the yeah. salespeople out there, but your buyer didn't wake up this morning, jumped out of bed, ran downstairs, woke the kids up and said, Hey, today's the day you know, John from XYZ company is coming to visit me today. I can't wait. I've just been on my calendar for six months. Like, I think we think that in our mind subconsciously, but they're not doing that. They care about what they care about, which is their self-preservation, which is their problems, which is the impact of the risks and the, the, the threats and the missed opportunities in their world. So when you show up in the, the meeting with a customer and you talk about your product, it is completely antagonistic to their world. And, and that's where I think a lot of salespeople, unfortunately, and organizations get it wrong. We have to train on product 100%. You got to well, be an expert. Yeah. Got to be an expert. Um, but we need to train on the problem that we solve with equal, if not more measure. Yeah, and I think one of the other things, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think this is uh, underlined by what you're talking about, is I think sometimes we forget the amount of personal pressure that somebody is on under in a B2B purchasing decision, right? And not just them, but there's probably a group of other people involved, there's a lot of people involved, but we always, we always just focus, as you say, on the problem that we're solving for the organization. We don't always take into account that, hey, you know, Jeff might have a lot of writing on this personally right. too. So I also have to make sure that he is comfortable with making that, this decision. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think if you think about the word that we use all the time, and it's, 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 it's caught fire in the business community finally, and especially in the coaching world, is empathy. And there's a, we have the science behind it now. When you operate out of empathy, you activate a different part of the person you're talking to's brain. And uh, Richard Boyatzis, who's a partner with Daniel Goleman, a lot of the emotional intelligence work, he wrote uh, Primal Leadership and uh, Helping People Change is his latest book. What he found is you can communicate down one of two pathways in the brain, the analytical pathway or the empathic pathway. And in their research, they've done gobs of it. They found that when you communicate down the customer's analytical pathway, they have to evaluate, analyze, and they're not open to change. In the end, that's why status right. quo rules the day. But if you operate down their empathic pathway, they connect, they build trust, and they're open to change. So you, you can choose <laughs> which pathway to operate down. But it, to your point, the pressure I feel as a buyer, you mm -hmm. don't even know my world. You don't understand yeah. what I'm up against. And the risk that I perceive if I make a bad decision uh, can cripple my career, can cripple my what? fill in the blank. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny, I, I think that's a good uh, point for people to take away. So if you are, if you are losing out a lot to no decision, maybe you want to look at that, uh, whether you're going down the wrong path there and whether you need to be more empathetic. Um, yeah, listen, uh, Jeff, we're bumping up against the end of our time here, but maybe is there one, is there one last message you'd like to give to people about how they are approaching their selling today and maybe some ways that they could uh, even simple little tweaks that they could make. Yeah. A couple small tips. Number one, what I've found, especially in the B2B world is the salesperson who can hold their solution the longest usually wins. And what I mean by that is if you spend the earliest part of your conversation talking about how to build trust, not rapport. I think that's an old cliche. I see you have a picture of a sailboat on your wall. Do you sail? I drink water. Um, not that true connection with your customer, empathetic connection, then spend the next amount of time talking about their goals and their problems. And if you can hold your solution longer and then match it up to that problem that your customer stated, you're going to win a lot more than you lose. Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think also, yeah, I think that whole kind of fake rapport thing is, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of irritating and stuff, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we could do an experiment sometime and just put a load of fake children behind you. And then when somebody starts asking you about them, go, I've no idea who those are. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's funny is it came, asked, it came with the frame. <laughs> yeah. I ask salespeople this all the time. They think, well, Jeff, it works for me. I do it all the time. I'm like, do you think you're the only salesperson who's ever picked out that pics, that picture of a sailboat and made a comment of it? Do you think you're unique there by picking that out? No. Every single salesperson that walks through that buyer's door has done the exact same thing. And because they're a nice person, they placate you and pretend like they care. But they don't. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Whereas, um, whereas most of us really, well, as you said, 
it's all about trust and developing a comfort level that I can trust that you are going to help me solve. The number one, you understand my problem, and second, all that you can help me help me solve it. I mean, that's that's the basic foundation for the rest of the conversation, isn't it? That's it. Without without trust, you're nowhere. Yeah. All right, but before we go, Jeff, uh, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your organization, how they, and what kind of services you guys offer? Yeah, we, we focus mostly on uh, the B2B space and we work with uh, usually pretty, pretty large um, sales organizations, Fortune 1000. We have done some smaller work, but we take people through our message development and then our neuro selling program. Braintrustgrowth.com is our website. You can learn more about it there. And it's all based on the neuroscience of decision making. And that gives everybody an anchor to go back. And when they're doing things wrong, uh, it's science. So when I tell you to do it differently, <laughs> you really can't argue with me. I'm, I'm giving you the science behind why we tell you to do it the way we do it. So um, that's the way to go. And Neuro Selling, the book, is coming out um, probably first of the year. So there'll be a new book out Excellent. on the whole topic. So Fantastic. Uh, and maybe you come back at the beginning of the year when the book's released and talk more to us. I'd love to. All right, great. All right, listen, Jeff Broom, uh, Bloomfield, uh, Brain Trust, uh, thank you very much for talking with us today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.